Welcome, everybody, to this week's episode of the Directed IRA Podcast, your source for authoritative, interesting, strategic IRA, 401k, everything self-directed planning. Wow, that sounds good. That that, That sounds good. Let's just record that. We'll just start every episode like that. Yeah, if you hear that again. I I don't know why, but I thought of like a WWE or WWF wrestler, like, body slamming someone and they're like with authority huh? that's that's what came to mind <laughs> yeah so yeah. i thought we should have had some music in the background we'll have to work on that well yeah, anyway, to... my, yeah. my name is sorry, mark good. kohler yeah my name is mark kohler i'm a tax lawyer and uh small business advisor just an entrepreneur at heart love an american dream in main street america and i'm here with my illustrious another good adjective yeah, um, like that Matt Sorensen, who is the author of the Directed IRA Handbook, the best-selling book in America on how to self-direct your retirement account and control your future. Man, we just yeah. need to freaking reward me today. That I is. I mean, did you take some like lessons or something? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, he pulled that out of his butt. That's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're making us sound really cool today for the podcast, yeah, yeah. but um, but we're grateful you're here, and we've got a lot of prior episodes, of course, on what is self-directing and all those topics. We want to focus on an important item, though, the inherited IRA, um, sometimes called a beneficiary IRA. A lot of people self-direct these accounts. I mean, it's with retirement accounts being around since the 70s, these are now starting to pass on to the next generation. And yep. so we're and seeing more of these accounts. accounts. Yeah, and but it's also sometimes called the holy grail of IRA accounts. Hmm? Yeah, it is. Can you live with- we'll, we'll go through some of these reasons on why this is the thing. Like if your, you know, parents, well, whoever it is, pass away, and you you're hoping for some asset to inherit. Let me tell you, the one thing you want to get if you get a hundred thousand dollars in gold, a hundred thousand dollars in a checking account, hundred thousand dollars from life insurance proceeds, or a hundred thousand dollars in a Roth IRA. Those assets are not equal. I know they're all $100,000 and you're thinking, well, what's the difference? Trust me, the Roth IRA. Listen, we'll tell you why you want that asset over anything. Okay, so that means you do not share this podcast with your siblings, although we want you to share this podcast everywhere you can. This would be the one that you want to keep in your back pocket because when you're at the poker table, do, you know, that didn't sound good, Matt, right? I mean, we've got to give a disclaimer here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the poker table. That's a little... You know, let's just say when you're at the dining table, you know, discussing yeah. the options. It's a somber yeah. day. You know. It is. And and I will on a on a good note. I, I mean on a professional, sensitive note, we should have given this disclaimer initially. When we're talking about death and inherited assets, in particular today, the IRA or the 401k, please uh know that we're trying to just make this topic palatable. It's no fun talking about death. And we know some of you may have had some family members or friends, especially affected by COVID this year and passed away or just normal wear and tear or some crazy accident. But we just want to say we're um, be patient with this. We're going to make this as enjoyable as we can, which might involve some puns or jokes about dying. Hey, we're all going to die. Okay, how was yeah. that? Was that okay? Are we that's okay. Claim? And that's, that's true. We will, we will all die. So um, we just want to talk about what happens to your retirement account. So uh, let me say one other thing though. This is important for those that are self-directing because we're going to walk through the options here in a second. The one thing you have to keep in mind, if you're self-directing an inherited IRA, you have to be careful because you do need some liquidity at a certain point. We're going to go through that, but I just want to say that as you're thinking about self-directing an inherited IRA, um, there's some timing rules here where eventually that asset needs to be sold so you can get it to cash to then distribute it out. We'll go over that here in a moment, but I just want to say that it it does take a little more planning for self-directed accounts than others, Um, but it's still very doable, very easy. Lots of our clients are doing using inherited IRAs to self-direct. Yeah, and I... And I, I want, I've, I've got some other news or some fun items that are unrelated to this. We'll come back to that later. But I would suggest this be our approach to the topic. Tell me if you, Matt's the expert, so I'm going to throw this out. Why don't we talk about 
inheriting a retirement account if you're a spouse. Yep. And inheriting a retirement account if you're not. Yep. And, and agree. And out there, we're, our show's 50 50. We got a lot of single folks, a lot of married folks, don't feel picked on. Maybe we should flip a coin. Which mm -hmm. one we go with? Because yeah. um, some people feel like we're chauvinistic in one particular way or another. Now, currently I'm married, Matt's not. So we can, you know, we're, we, we, we can work that angle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of us is single, one's not. Um, so um, anyway, I was going to make another comment that would not be appropriate. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not, my wife is listening to the show, so I'm not going to say anything. But anyway, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I will throw this out. Um, but we want to talk about 401ks, IRAs, Roths, all types of retirement accounts under those two categories. So Matt, who, what do you want to do first, single or married? Oh, let's do the spouse. Let's do the spouse first. It's a little easier. Right. Um, so when your spouse passes away, let's say you're the surviving spouse here. All right. Um, you, your first option is to do what's called a spousal rollover. Now, this is not an inherited IRA or sometimes called a beneficiary. This is becomes your IRA. So let's say, you know, your spouse passes away, they had an IRA or 401k in their name, it was their account. What happens is you can transfer that account over into your IRA in your name. If you already have, let's say a traditional IRA and your spouse passed away and they had a traditional IRA, you can just transfer that, those assets over into your IRA. And so it's treated like it's just your IRA now. That is unique for spouses. Everyone else, you can't do that. This is a unique option for spouses that's really beneficial because now it's just under the regular retirement account rules for you in your age. And when do you turn 59 and a half or 72? Now, what about an ex-spouse? Um, Cause there's some social security benefits for an ex-spouse yeah. if they were married so long. Does it, is there any factor if they're an ex-husband, ex-wife? Nothing. Okay. They're right. non-spouse. They, they'll be in category two if you, or crazy enough to leave your retirement account to your ex-spouse. <laughs> or, or, I don't know. I've, yes. you know, it's funny. I've had, I've had many clients in the self-directed space in particular that are former spouses, divorced, that still are in deals together and still continue to. It's whatever. Fun. Okay. Or, yeah, or they forget to amend their beneficiaries. Mm. People, yeah. if you've been divorced or your spouse passed away, and you're thinking about getting remarried or whatever. I mean, anyway, if you're not married anymore, you might need to go and update your beneficiaries, but topic yeah, for a separate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now I have your retirement account passes. Keep in mind, it's not your will. It's not your trust. Your retirement account passes based on your beneficiary designation. So if you list your spouse first, as we're talking about here, it's going to go to your spouse, of course, and they can do this spousal rollover. Now they could take a lump sum if they want. So if your surviving spouse, and let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar IRA, you could say, no, nah, I don't want to roll it over. I just want all the cash. And maybe you're, maybe you're 50, you're not 59 and a half yet. So if you rolled the money over to a spousal rollover, 59 and a half, you're not gonna be able to start in your 50. You have to wait nine and a half years before you can take distributions because it follows your retirement account rules. But let's say it's again, spouse passes away, you're 50 and you need the money. You would want to maybe take a lump sum though. Okay. Or you could take the 10 year actually as well, which we'll talk about here in a second. That's available to everyone um, where, where you can get access to the funds over time without a 10% early withdrawal penalty. Okay. So I'm a surviving spouse. My first and probably the most typical choice is to do a rollover and just put it in my retirement account. Now that means also if your spouse had a Roth IRA, you would roll it into your Roth IRA. Or if you didn't have a Roth IRA, you would have to, well, actually when you have an inherited Roth or inherited IRA, you actually set up, well, no, if you're a spouse, you just roll spouse, it into your spouse, you'll just set up your own. Yeah, if, you'd, if yeah. you had a Roth IRA, like you said, it would just go to your Roth IRA. If you didn't have one, you just set up a new Roth IRA that's your Roth IRA, and this these funds or assets get transferred to it. And we're doing those yeah. constantly here at Directed IRA. Yep. And this new inherited IRA account, that's going to come in option two. We'll come to that. Now, yeah. um, I'm the spouse and my surviving spouse and my husband or wife died 
and was currently working and had a 401k, what happens? Same thing. The, the 401k, you can do a spousal rollover on a 401k to an IRA. If it was traditional 401k dollars, again, to traditional mm -hmm. IRA, Roth 401k dollars could go to Roth IRA. Okay. And if I was a surviving spouse and had a current job with a 401k, I suspect I could do a plan to plan transfer. No, or would I have to go to into an IRA first and then back into the 401k? Could I put it in my 401k at work? Not at work. Cause I mean, possibly I've never seen anyone do that. Or I don't a solo know. 401k. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or I'm just, the, I'm the one that's like, Matt even tells me this before the podcast. Don't ask questions. You don't know the answer to that's a, that's a typical rule a lawyer follows in court. The yeah. podcast, I throw it out the window, but I always start thinking of all these creative ideas and, and that's, you know, that's one of my, I'll I, say. it's funny because, it, you know, I've done this so long. I run into the questions of things people actually do. Um, mm. So sometimes I get a question. It's like, well, yeah, I, I get that as a theoretical question why you're interested in it, but no one does that. Yeah. Good point. Now, if they yeah. have a solo pay in their small business, then and you wanted yeah. to avoid UDFI or you wanted to borrow yeah. against it, more than likely you'd be able to roll it from a 401k to another 401k as the spouse inheriting that money. But again, yeah. fairly unique. Okay. Now you said, Matt, option two for a spouse is if, oh my gosh, I need to pay bills. I need to maybe pay off a debt, a mortgage on a property, maybe the home. My, my yeah. income has gone down. My spouse passed away and I need that cash all at once. You said I could just take a lump sum distribution. Do I pay penalty? Nope, no penalty. So you're, you, the 10% rate withdrawal penalty is waived because you're taking okay. this distribution upon death of your former spouse. Um, but, um, you pay tax. but you will pay tax on, if it's a traditional IRA, you will pay tax on the amount you distribute. Okay. Now, if you say, well. So we I don't like you. that unless you need it. You know, that's yeah. not smart unless you need it. Yeah, but then option three is, well, I need it, but I don't need all of it. And yeah. I kind of have, I'd like to have that as a safety net without a penalty if I need it in the next 10 years. Um, Cause I, the surviving spouse may have other assets they inherited or their own retirement account. So they go, I kind of want this hybrid. That's where the 10 year rule comes into play. You, can you explain that? Yeah, so the, the 10 year rule is, is is new. This is under the Secure Act, by the way. So this came into effect a couple of years ago. Um, under this 10-year rule, what happens is, upon the date of death, the heir, the who is inheriting the account, has 10 years to take a distribution of that asset. So you receive it in an inherited IRA, and you have 10 years now to take a distribution. You could take a little bit year one, a little bit year two, a little bit year three. You could hold it all off until year five. You could decide at year six, oh, I want to just take it all out and clean it out because I need it all. You have just that 10-year window to kind of do what you want with it without early withdrawal penalties. And um, But again, tax, if it's traditional, is you, for what you do take out, no tax, though, in the Roth. And, and so, so that's the 10-year rule. Okay. Now, if I'm thinking strategy and my spouse passes away, they leave me a traditional IRA or a Roth. And remember a 401k is going to be in the same character. It's either going to be a 401k mm -hmm. traditional or 401k Roth. Yeah. If I inherited a Roth, I would be inclined, I would be inclined to say, do the 10 year on the Roth and maybe do the rollover on the regular traditional. Because if As I did spouse. the tenure, yeah, if I was a spouse, I'm thinking I'd want to have that Roth inherited because then I could pull it out tax free anytime in the next 10 years. And I'd have to drain yeah. it in 10 years, but at least there'd be no penalty and no tax. If I do a rollover and I'm not 59 and a half, I'm going to have problems accessing that. Yeah. It so depends on what you want and how old you are. Let's say, let's say you're, you're 50, you know? Well, you're going to be in nine and a half years, you're going to be able to pull that money out of your Roth anyways, if you did a spousal rollover to a Roth IRA. 
Now you won't have access to it for that nine and a half years, but eventually you'll get to the money, but you can keep it invested as a Roth through the rest of your lifetime, you know, with, within total tax deferral, growing tax-free, coming out tax-free, tax-free. So I'd actually, I actually would go the other way, frankly. I would say go Roth as a spousal rollover and, and um, maybe you do the tenure on the traditional because if that's a pot of funds that you're like, well, maybe I'll need that money. And frankly, you're only going to pull that money out if you got a low income, right? So you're, you're not going to pay a lot of tax on it because you're only going to be using it if you need the income. Um, yeah. So that, and, and I probably go, you know, if you're like, I don't need the money to live on right now, do spousal rollover on both accounts yeah, um, yeah. And, and just continue yeah. the same tax deferral. So I think what you want to do is take a, take an assessment here and say, do I need this money or not? Can I let this stay for the long term? Um, do I need the money or not? Now, let's say you're already 59 and a half, you know, a spouse, you're over 59 and a half already. Do the spouse to rollover all day long. Absolutely. All day long. There's no question at that point because you can take the money yeah. out day two once you roll it over. Now, here's let's talk strategy still. This is this is where I think Matt and I complement each other. I'm a button pusher. You know, I was a little kid and get an elevator and start pushing buttons just to see what happened. Um, <laughs> as I think most five year old boys are. Um, so I would think that if I'm trying to build up my retirement and I'm married, if you've got the funds from the success of your business or you're building wealth, when possible, you want to double down. I would want to build my wife, Jennifer's Roth at the same time I'm building mine, because if she passes away, I'm going to have both and vice versa. If I pass away, she'll have both. And so I think a lot of married people forget to say, well, yeah, the Roth contribution in a 401k is 19.5 or 6,000 in a regular Roth this year. But if I'm married, I can double that and I'm going to inherit it anyway. Um, and if you do get divorced, you're going to split retirement assets down the middle anyway, typically. Um, I don't want to foray into divorce law with retirement accounts. Ooh, we should do it. We should do a podcast and get a divorce lawyer in here on that one. That just, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, yeah kind of like podcast. the five tips every business owner should know from their divorce lawyer. Ooh, I like that one. Okay, now. <laughs> But, but again, the strategy is, wouldn't you agree, Matt, that whenever you're contributing to a retirement account, if you've got the, the funds, double down, would you not? Yeah, say? absolutely. Absolutely. That's, and that's, that's one of the great things about being married. I mean, <laughs> there's many reasons, but from a retirement account tax standpoint is you each get your individual contribution amount. So you're able to double up on these things. Um, and even when you have a working spouse and a non-working spouse, sometimes that's the case. Um, particularly if there's kids at home, you know, then uh, you know you can do what's called a spousal contribution, or if the other one doesn't have income at the time, you can use the working spouse's income to make that uh, contribution. So um, pretty cool. There, there, there was some forethought there, I think, by Congress on letting married couples double down on these, even with the, like I said, the non-working spouse, where you can do that spousal contribution. Yeah. Now I um. I love how Matt just flippantly says, oh, there's all these benefits to being married. Um, when we get to the single person, I'll make sure to remind Matt, there's all these benefits of being single. Um, <laughs> further gone, people, further gone. Okay, now I'm gonna throw out one Not last strategy. Matt. Not touching yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, like I said, I'm, I'm walking a fine line today. Okay, so what I'm just gonna throw out is one more strategy. Now, Matt, we also said this was kind of a weird hypothetical, but I actually think being strategic, we have a lot of engineers that listen to our podcast and engineers are strategic. They love this stuff. So Matt, I'm speaking to our audience. So just okay. chill out. Right. All right. So I think the rule is, and Matt said before the show, he's like, we'd have to research that. But my belief is, and if I had to put down a hundred bucks, I'd bet this. The election you take on whether you're going to do a lump sum, a 10 year or a rollover is spousal. based on spousal rollover, spousal yeah. lump, spousal, whatever the, on the spouse side is it's going to be a per retirement account election. 
You're not going to be able to divide up the retirement account. You're going to have an account at Les Schwab. <laughs> Les Schwab <laughs> for your tires. Prime access to tires. <laughs> oh my gosh. So that was, Charles Schwab. I obviously need new tires. So that's going on in the back. <laughs> so I have a retirement account at Charles Schwab or Merrill Lynch or wherever, Oppenheimer or directed IRA. That account is where I'm going to have to make my decision. I won't be able to parse it. So I think the strategy here would be, and we teach this anyway, is you can have multiple Roth accounts and you can have multiple traditional accounts. Some you may self-direct in the stock market. Some you may self-direct with private placements or notes or real estate. And so I think the day has come, Matt, too, in our day and age that people just don't have one IRA or one pension or whatever. They're going to probably have multiple yeah. accounts. And so the beauty of this is, as a surviving spouse, is you could say, well, this Roth, I'll do a 10 year, this one, I'll do a rollover, this one, I'll do a, a lump sum or this. So I think if you are married and you're really doing strategic planning, you're going to have multiple retirement accounts and therefore you could choose multiple strategies based on the number of accounts. So I think people are wondering, well, if I choose one, is that for all the accounts? Nope. I think it's a per account decision. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay. And um, yeah, I think there that's a awesome um, strategy. Option to have say, that. You know what's Mark? Yeah, say, strategy. You know what's Mark? Yeah. A great strategy. Yeah. Say it. Yeah, I didn't want to. Call, I didn't want to. I was just gonna say it's a great scheme. You know. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know? That's true. That, that's you know, there's strategies and schemes. You want to you know make sure you're okay. doing strategies. No, but that right. that's. That, I think that's just very pragmatic too. And I think the reality is when someone's sitting down at the end of the day, having to make these decisions and it's tough, I get it. You know, these are hard decisions is you do want to be a little pragmatic about it and, and not just go all in going one direction or the other. Think of your finances, think of what you're going to need for the next five, 10 years. And if the retirement accounts are an asset you're going to need, make some of these decisions a little different per account based on how much you're going to need. Okay, now believe it or not, Matt said at the beginning, at the beginning, this is the easier side of the equation. Um, yeah. <laughs> so now we're going to pray into a little more complexity. We're going to go over to where the grass is really green. You've looked over the fence and you're like, you know, what are those single people doing? They're running around, they're going to parties, <laughs> they're walking around on that green grass. And some of you may go, Matt, what, how is it over there? What's it like? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, It's great. You know, it's great. Let's just do that. It's good. Okay. So uh, now I'm not married and I inherit an IRA. So the, for anybody, this could be an ex-spouse, a kid. And this is where it's going to get complex. I want to talk about minor children in a big way. But where do you start there? All right. right. Let me make one um, note here before we get into the options. There was a rule change. So if you're listening to this, you're thinking, guys, what about the life expectancy method? There used to be something called the life expectancy method where let's say you're, you, you inherit a retirement account from parents or grandparents or anyone. It's not a spouse. You, so you just inherit from someone else. There was something called the life expectancy method where you could take that retirement account and, and you had to take distributions, but it was over your lifetime. So if you were 40 and you inherited, let's say your parents retirement account who passed away, you got to take distributions of that account over your lifetime, which the IRS thinks is going to be like another 50 years. And so you're taking like, you know, one, you know, 2% of that account essentially out every year because they think they're going to live 50 years and the rest of it gets to stay invested. All right. Now that was really cool for people who wanted to do what's called a stretch IRA. Um, you know, it let you stretch out the life of that. The Roth was even cooler because there is no RMD. Um, but you still got to use that account over your lifetime. And so that that rule, that there's no tax on there, I should say, that rule was in place and is still there. If you inherited an account prior to 2019, prior to the Secure Act taking effect, you still get those old rules. But for people setting up accounts now, their inherited accounts um, from someone that passed away, you know, in the last year or two now, you're operating under these new rules. So I just want to note that there's this life expectancy method. Some of you may be on if you have an inherited IRA previously. Um, you're, you're following those old rules, which are great for like the child that received the parent's account and you get to take it out over your lifetime now. 
Okay. Yeah. And one aspect of that too, was if you got it from a grandma or grandpa or a spouse that was over age 72 and, or 71 or 70 and a half, and they were doing what's called RMDs, required minimum distributions. And we're going to, we probably should have defined that term earlier. It was a lot more applicable under those old rules because an RMD said you're required to take a minimum distribution over some sort of calculation, but all that's gone now. So it doesn't matter if they were already doing RMDs, they were over 70, it doesn't matter how old you are anymore. The government said, we don't wanna let anybody sit on these retirement accounts longer than 10 more 10 years, period. Yeah. Kind of stuff. So, all right, let's go over your options now. You're a non-spouse inheriting an account. Maybe this is the boyfriend inheriting an account or this is the, you know, the child, whatever, okay? okay. Um, your first option is lump sum again. You could just take a lump sum, all right? And um, that, again, you're gonna get taxed on it. There's no 10% early withdrawal penalty, but you'll be taxed on if it's traditional, no tax if it's Roth. One thing I've seen in this that's important, that it, that's an option too, is to disclaim it. And we've had that recently um, where let's say, you know, p p grandparents pass away and passes the um, account, the beneficiary on the account is your mother. And, and your mom's like, well, I don't want it. I've got plenty of assets. They can disclaim it and pass it down to the next beneficiaries, which are maybe grandkids um, or, or even maybe a different sibling or something. So we've seen that where you can disclaim to kind of let the account go down to the next generation um, who may be have better use for that asset. Um, so just that's, that's an option too is always the disclaimer, but. But it would have some. to go to, but if I'm right, I, it would have to go to the benef this, the contingent beneficiary that was listed Correct. on the account by grandpa, grandpa. Correct. mother can say, oh, I'll just claim it and give it to my favorite kid. Nope. It's number two on the list that grandma or grandpa chose. Exactly. Okay. Yep. Yep. Which is so that would have had to be planned out. Yeah. That yeah. would have been planned out or, you know, your grandkid would have had to been on the beneficiary designation form as contingent. Yeah. And if you don't like your sister, you don't want to do that one because <laughs> yeah. Why just, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's your discovery. Okay. So, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. But this is where the strategy comes in. Okay. So you're not at the poker table. You're at the dining mm. room table. And grandpa or grandma, ooh, this is good. Grandpa or grandma, mom or dad, we have all adult children sitting at the dining room table. We're looking at the house, the land, the farm, the rental, and all this. And there's this Roth IRA sitting over there. And what the parent do? They name their spouse. And then all the kids as equal contingent beneficiaries, probably the most common. Right. Yeah. So if you the table, you'll say, well, I didn't inherit a Roth. We all did. You say, no, no, no. Hey, everybody at the table, if you guys will all sign this disclaimer and let me just have the Roth, then I'll give up my share of the house or the farm or the whatever we appraise. So you're going to get the same amount of dollars, but you can yeah. use the yeah. disclaimer to talk everybody into letting you have the Roth account entirely. Yeah. And you know Ooh. what, from a, from a administration standpoint, a lot of times that's easier because, you know, let's say there's four siblings and not, they're going to each get one fourth of the account. They all got to go set up a new account if they don't have one and roll it over. And it can be a little bit of some paperwork and everybody's got to do it rather than just saying, let me take this, you take that, let's split up the cash here. I'll get more of this because you got that. You know, so, sometimes assets move that way um, because it's just simpler to distribute. And so raise your hand to take the Roth IRA. You'll, you'll, yeah. because let's, let, let's state why let's make it clear. Why? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. That okay. let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar Roth IRA account and you've got, let's just say you've got one sibling. Let's just make it easy. And there's a checking account with a hundred thousand dollars that your other sibling's going to get. Okay. And so you're like, you just take that checking account with a hundred thousand at the bank. Um, I'm going to take this, uh, Roth IRA over here. That's a hundred thousand dollars of value. Okay, cool. We each got 50, 50. We're the two siblings. Now, now you've got 10 years of this hundred thousand to grow and it's going to come out tax free. So you turn this hundred thousand into 150 or 200 over the next 10 years. Now you've that 200,000 is going to come out of that account. No tax at all. All right. Mm -hmm. So you've got this 
tax-free vehicle to grow for another 10 years. Your sibling that took the $100,000 checking account of just cash, they, they turn that 100,000 into 200 grand, they're paying tax on that $100,000 appreciation, you know? Right. So, so that's, that's why we like the Roth is it's just this tax-free vehicle, particularly when you inherit it, it's already got some assets and money and it's kind of primed and ready to go. You get a 10 year run on it. It's kind of cool. Yeah. And the, and a couple other things that make it fantastic is you, um, you can take out the money in stages yearly, wait the whole 10 years, wait nine years and 364 days and then drain it. And all the money you earned in there is tax free. Now, there's a lot of rules out there, rules of seven, rule of eight, blah, blah, blah. And if you're averaging a 20% return, that 100 grand could easily turn into 500 grand or some other things. So you just start doing math on the future value of 100 grand. And you can pull up any website calculator to do this and put in an interest rate or a rate of return because you're listening to this show because you're like, hell, I could take that 100 grand and do notes all year long with points and interest, I could average 15 to 18% every year. You do the math on that, that's all tax-free. And the beauty is you can take it out anytime you want. You can just walk over there to the ATM next year on a Thursday in November and go, I need 50 grand, I need 20 grand. No penalty, no tax. That's why it's the holy Love grail, it. baby. Boom. Yeah, that's so that's the trick, there you go. Um, Okay, let's okay. say you don't want to do lump sum. Um, we've hit, we've discussed this ten-year rule just briefly. There, that's the the most common option I think a non-spouse beneficiary is going to do is that you have ten year to distribute ten years to distribute the assets. Oh, um, yeah, we can't do. We can't do the spousal. The spousal. Role. Yeah, that doesn't that's work. Correct. That's unique to spouses where you can go into an account in your name. So if you're not a spouse, um, you're going to be the lump sum or really the 10 year rule. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to just say it just so you all were like, well, don't I, can I do the rollover? Nope. So just to get it out there so that there's no miscommunication or, um, is that that one rollover option is unique to spouses. And you say, well, it's my mom. It's my dad. It doesn't matter. It's my ex-wife. It's my ex-husband. doesn't matter. So you, they, you've got to be married as of the date of death and in order to make that election, to roll it over to your type of, same type of account, whether it's a Roth or traditional. Yeah. Um, but your two options are stretch it over 10 with no penalty or tax, and I can take it at any time, whether it's Roth or traditional, or do the lump sum. Now, can I explain what IRD is, Matt? Okay. Sure. I think yes. I need to say that. So IRD is, is called income in respect of a decedent. Now, this is the bad news of the show. Oh, by the way, I've got good news and bad news I tell you about. Okay, Ooh, but, okay. okay, we'll come to that right up there. But the bad news here, if anything, is this IRD. Because you might say, well, if I inherit something, I don't, I don't pay tax. Well, that's if you inherit a home stepped up basis. You inherit a life insurance account, no tax. You inherit a Roth IRA, no tax. But if you're at the dining room table and there's a traditional IRA sitting there, you don't want that. You want to say, <laughs> yeah. you want to say, Hey, bro, sister, take the traditional IRA. You can stretch it out over 10 years. And they're like, Oh, that's nice. But because mom and dad never took out the IRA and paid tax, the person that inherits it has to claim that income in respect of a decedent and pay the tax as if mom and dad had taken it. So the strategy is here, and this is like you're playing Rook, you're playing poker, you're playing who knows what card game. Um, you're gonna wanna grab the Roth and you wanna get, it, get rid of or discard the traditional IRA because you don't want that IRD. That income and respect of decedent sucks. Um, yeah. And so when you take a lump sum, you have to pay IRD. And it's not at mom's and dad's tax rate. It's at whatever your tax rate is that year, your marginal rate. So if you already made 200 grand that year or 50 grand or 100 grand, when you pop in that IRA money in a lump sum, 
it, it's going to get, it's going to bump you into a higher bracket and you're going to have to strategize over 10 years. That's why Matt, of course, said, take the 10 year, damn it. It's just better that way. Cause you, you can even yeah. sh- spread it out over three years and just keep yourself in a lower bracket rather than going to the highest bracket all at once. Now, if you got to pay off the mafia or you've got a huge mortgage and you're going to lose the family farm, maybe you have to rip the bandaid off and pay a crappy tax rate. But if not, you want to strategically take it so the IRD keeps you in a lower bracket over that 10 years. Mm-hmm. Well, do you like that? That was pretty. Cool. I like that. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm like skeptical of yeah. me explaining so, IRD. He's yeah. Like, I was like, I was like, it's that uh, leave it to a CPA tax lawyer to throw out an acronym that even I didn't know after reading this stuff for so long. Um, <laughs> all right. What's um, the good news and bad news though? Oh, okay. So I, uh, the, the good news that there's, you, you have IRD or that was the bad ones. No, 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 no. Okay. This is off topic. Just keep the show lively and interesting. And so okay. we have so many engineers that love our show. So you guys will love this. So I was on my, it has to do with Tesla. So do you, Tesla, Tesla, I was on my Tesla login on tesla.com. So okay. do you want the good news or bad news first? You choose. Give me the good news. Uh, the good news is I'm in the front one third of the line okay. for my cyber truck. So if there's a hundred people in line for a cyber truck, okay. I'm in the first third, I'm one through 33. I'm in, I'm right there okay. in the first 33% of people to get their cyber truck. That's I, they finally have, you can find, you can do a calculation. If you go to Tesla and you've ordered a cyber truck, you can do the math. Okay. to figure out where we're at in line. So that's the good news. And, and the bad, the bad news is? The bad the news bad is, is I'm, 200 and, I'm number 232,000 and change. Oh. But that's okay because... Oh, I, I thought the bad news is you'll be driving a Tesla truck. <laughs> One day. <laughs> Such a jerk. I can't... No, a Tesla... Everybody wants a Tesla truck because they're so kick ass they're so cool Al- uh-huh. almost bulletproof uh mm-hmm. you know elon almost, musk did yeah. The, yeah he did the first test case with this baseball bat but we're gonna we're, it's improved you know but okay. the Tesla yeah. truck is looking good 2022 they're gonna start delivering and i'm number 232,000 and change there's over 750,000 orders now so wow i'm in the front third of the line cool you don't want a GM truck? Do you know no. GM is going all electric by 2035? Boy, how it's old crazy. will I be at 2035? I'll be driving a, a, a lowered Cadillac and Boca Raton in 2035. <laughs> yeah, I'll be cruising around the Boca Vista. The Boca Vista. I'll be driving a golf cart around, you know, uh, Florida communities, yeah. calling out people leaving their garbage cans out on the street. Hey! Get your right hand in. All right. Um, okay. Sorry for the diversion there. The part in the uh, little little joke there in the middle. I appreciate that, Mark. That was funny. Um, okay. All right. Let me say this on inherited IRAs because I made this point at the beginning. Again, if you're self-directing, you have to think of this stuff like, all right. If I took the ten-year rule, you know, I eventually got to sell this asset in ten years. So let's see, you know, let's say you inherited a self-directed account and it's an inherited IRA now, and it's got a piece of real estate in it. Okay. Well, that's not a liquid asset. You're just going to sell, you know, on the market, whatever it's trading at, at the last day of 10 years to meet the rule, right? You got to plan for that. Make sure you sell it. The market's not going to coordinate, you know, it's appreciation for you. It could be good. It could be bad. So maybe once you're hitting seven years, you know, you're starting to think about that and like, all right, should I sell it now? Where am I at? Do I need the money? You know, don't wait till the last year to, to make that decision unless you, you know, you've got the magic crystal ball and know the uh, the exact time to sell real estate. So just keep that in mind. There's a little extra consideration for self-directed accounts that are inherited. Okay. Now, next strategy as some, you know, non-friends would say scheme. Uh, can hurt your feelings if you're yeah. out to this weekend. Um, 
but Matt would never do that to me. He would never use that mm. word. But um, it okay, was, here's it was only in jest. Yeah, I'm just not here for color commentary. Here's the strategy I think is very important. What about kids that should not inherit my retirement account? They may be uh, immature when it comes to money. They might have a drug addiction or some sort of addiction. They could have be in a, a bad marriage. They could be in a community property state. I mean, there's a variety the of reasons. Them, you know, debts yep. and creditors. IRS is after them or who knows what. And you might have a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, and you've already got 500 grand sitting in an IRA or 401k. And you're like, well, you guys drafted a trust for me where the kids get money when they're 25, 30 and 35, and they get money for college, money for a wedding, money to start a business, buy a first home. But we don't want an 18 year old running around with 500 grand. And by the time that five or seven year old gets to 18, that 500 grand is probably going to be 1.5 million because you're self-directed. You know what you're doing. So what do you do? Well, before the secure act, uh, approximately um, eight to 10 years ago, there was legislation passed for what's called the see-through trust. Now the see-through trust is a provision under federal law that says, if you draft a trust that meets four criteria, then when you die, you can name the trust as the beneficiary of a retirement account. And we're gonna look through it and let the kid or whoever the beneficiary is, well, I'm gonna say it this way, we're gonna look through it and let the trustee make any tax elections on behalf of a beneficiary that make the best sense or the most sense from a tax perspective for the beneficiary without taxing it at trust rates. Now, and I'll shut up here and Matt, and I know you got a lot to say on this too, but the problem was before this is parents would say, well, I, I, if I've got a hundred thousand um, dollar IRA, I'd rather pay tax at 35% and give the kid 65 grand when they can handle it rather than just give them a hundred grand now and have them blow it, yeah. even though they might be a lower tax rate. Because what kids will do, guess what they're going to choose? Lump sum. And they're going to be driving around a Ferrari and you're going to be up in heaven, very disappointed. At least we hope <laughs> you're up. Okay, yeah. you hope you're up. So the c trust was a way to say, you know what? We kind of want the best of both worlds. We want to we want to hold the money in some ways for the kid and have that safety net. Mm -hmm. But we also want to make a tax election if it makes sense. And if this sounds complicated, it, it is. But it's an option. How would, Matt, what's your take on it or explanation too? It's kind of fun topic. Yeah, and the see-through trust, one of the rules on it is that you, it has to identify the beneficiary. So the trust terms itself would need to identify who are these beneficiaries. And so, you know, um, what I always recommend clients do is when you're doing your retirement account beneficiary as a default, you know, every situation is unique, but as a default, list your spouse first if you have one, and then your trust second as the beneficiary of your retirement account. That way, particularly if you have minor children, you know, it's going to pass according to the trust terms. Now, let's say you're no, like, you know, I've got, go, go ahead. I'm just going to say, Matt, Matt needs to make a correction there. If you're married, you name your spouse first. If you're single, you name your law partner first and then your kids. Oh, okay. okay. Be the right to but I'm just, okay. just want to make sure that's out there. Okay. Yeah. No, I might need to update, so I, update the forms. <laughs> that's a big update. By the way, it's in your email. Go ahead and open that okay. up and just, just verify that. Don't even, don't even read it. It's just fine okay. print. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Um, so the beneficiaries get this IRA. The beneficiaries get this IRA. Keep going. Sorry, I, I'm being yeah, done yeah. today. So the trust is going to identify them, and then, and then let let's say okay, you pass. Let's say your spouse has already predeceased you. It's just going to go on to, to the trust now, and it's going to pass down to the kids. Now, let's say you had two kids. So there's going to be the trustees going back. All right, there's two kids here, the beneficiaries of this retirement account, and Let's say one of them's, you know, pretty good with the money. Um, and what I think a smart trustee would do is just do a 10 year rule on both of them, do inherited IRAs on both of them. Um, and then let that, let that money stay invested and then distribute it out at the end of 10 years to them and, and let them, let them take that account and basically, you know, 
and, and let them be involved in investing it. Of course, this is your account and, and, and let them be involved again, if they, they know what they're doing. Now you could have the other situation though. They don't know what they're doing, or they've got a drug and alcohol addiction. They've got financial issues. The trustee may kind of divvy out money as they go year to year. Right. And say, Hey, I'm going to maybe give you 10 grand through the year, you know, to our, whatever it is from this account, but the trustee can kind of dole that money out. Um, according to the trust terms of what you have had in there and our, our state plans have those standard terms in there for addiction or credit or issues where the trustee can withhold distributions of any asset, the retirement account assets that they are controlling here, or, you know, any of your cash accounts or equity in your house, whatever may come. Yeah. And in our standard trust design for every client in the country, single or married, we have this see-through provision. So we comply with those four parts of the test. And I've got a really touching, a touching story here. I'm not just here for jokes too, but, but here in a moment, but you, you want to um, maybe elaborate on that provision. So we charge 1500 bucks for an estate plan, any state, single or married. That's our standard. You get it an hour or so with the attorney. Paralegals are there to help you. It freaking rocks. And we meet people all the time that said, well, I spent three grand or I spent five grand. And we're like, well, look at our docs. There's yeah, at least I've had clients 10, you know, 10K plus on estate plans. It's really bad. There's a lot of lawyers that value bill and and we get a, we, we're not liked by a lot of attorneys that are in a state planning realm because they think we're too cheap. And we're like, the docs rock. We've been building it for 20 years. They have every bell and whistle your freaking docs do. And we just want to be affordable. Now it is true though, when we have a client that has a net worth that requires an AB trust, or here's what I'm getting to, you want to kind of put some provisions like Matt just said, where the trustee has this ability to divvy out money, do the 10 year deal. But at the 10th year, when this kid or one of them shouldn't really get the money, we want to type in provisions that you give to us that we would say, you know what, take the distribution into the trust, pay a higher trust tax rate, even though that logically mm -hmm. that would not be a good move financially, but it's a good move personally for that child. And, yeah. and so when clients come to us and say, well, I want your trust, 1500 bucks sounds great. And then we, in our consult, we talk about things like this, his kids, her kids, marriage, second, blah, blah, blah. we're going to add some hours there is you want to kind of fine tune things and that's okay. But we don't have this flat fee where everybody gets hosed for five grand or 10 grand. We'll start at 1500 and we can add some bells and whistles. So when you're working with one of our attorneys, make sure you bring that up and go, Hey, 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 I remember when Matt and Mark were talking about the see through trust. And I've got a 10 year old and in 10 years, they're going to be 20. And I don't know if I want them getting that money because you got to give it to them within 10 years. Mm -hmm. So you may say, pay the damn tax. I don't care if it's 10% more at the trust rate versus the kid's individual rate, because that's what's best for my kid. Yeah. And keep in mind when you're distributing funds out on a traditional IRA to the kids, um, you know, they're paying tax at their rate. So the yeah. heir of that account, now that's good. If you're distributing out over time, they're not getting into a huge tax rate. The individual rates are lower than the trust tax rates, like Mark was mentioning there. So that's the more efficient way to do it. And at the end of the day, it's at the end of 10 years and there's a large balance still left in the account. Um, and the kid is in good financial situation. Just they'll, you'll, they'll have to distribute the whole thing to them. Um, and they'll get a large tax bill that year for the large distribution. But, um, but that's, that's the right way. The problematic child, um, you know, that has their financial issues or others, um, protecting that money and future problems that giving them that money could have is worth the court, the trust tax you're talking about, Mark. I think that's a really smart thing to think about for those that could run into this situation. And it does, it comes up. Yeah. Now, and it, yeah, it does. And, and as an aside, some of you may be going, well, what if it's a Roth? Then there is no trust rate. And there is no individual tax rate. The see-through allows the kid to get the Roth tax-free at the ninth year, 364th day. But again, yeah. it's no longer a retirement account. And now it's just basically cash, you know, it's an asset yeah. or the, 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 an asset. So 
but the trust still would own it. Yeah. Now, if you don't take that Roth distribution because it's in the worst um, result for the child, by not distributing it within the 10 years, then a Roth would have some penalties and tax. And I, I don't even know the calculation. But it's not it's good. It's a 50% penalty. Oof. Yeah, so do not mess with that 10-year rule. <laughs> now, is that for IRAs too or just the Roth? That's for all accounts, not distributed, but within 10 years. Wow. Man, do you give your 21-year-old a million dollars when they're 21 years old or pay the tax of 500 grand and wait till they can handle it? Ooh, that's a tough decision. Well, you still distribute the Roth out. You close out the Roth and let the trust pay the taxes, but now the trust just owns the assets. There's no Roth account anymore. Well, that's what I mean. But the trust would pay 500 grand in tax and then be able to hold that last 500 grand. You mean trust tax rates, not the penalty. Well, or whatever. I mean, the penalty is 50% plus tax? Well, the, the penalty is 50%. Yeah. Plus you probably have the tax to, if you did, cause you still have to get the asset distributed. But I'm just saying, if you were, if you're the trustee, you're coming on 10 years, you got a kid that you don't want yeah. them to get the assets of the trust. Yeah. So do a distribution, close out the Roth, but the trust owns the assets. Now the distribution yeah. went to the trust. Yeah. So there's no 50% mm -hmm. penalty, but the trust is going to pay all the taxes because it cuts all the income, but although Roth, it wouldn't. So what I'm saying is the Roth IRA ends, but the cash that the Roth had, if you get it to cash, let's say at the end of the day here, would be an asset of the trust, which it would still hold. So the 50% penalty would not apply. Yeah, but here's right. my take. Now, whenever Matt and I debate legal rules here on the podcast, just realize this is what sometimes clients are like, well, I have that situation. I'll pay you to research it. I don't think Matt and mm -hmm. I have the time to pay for this today, but here's my issue. I'm just going to say it technically. And some of you might appreciate this because you love a good uh, cerebral podcast is let's say there's a million dollars there. It's in a Roth mm -hmm. and I've got, I'm the trustee and I've got a see-through provision. I'm coming up on the 10th year. Now, the reason why the Roth is tax-free is because the trust is required to give the money to the beneficiary in order for it to be tax-free. See, the 10-year distribution rule is I got to distribute it to the beneficiary named in the IRA by the 10th year. If I take it into the trust and don't distribute it to the kid, I think even if it's a Roth, you're going to pay trust rates because you didn't follow the rule and actually give it to the kids. Now, I think you're right. You avoid the 50% penalty. Right. But I, I agree with exactly what you said. Yep. I agree do. exactly. With you. Okay. Okay. So the Roth would probably pay tax. You pay tax on yeah. a Roth. Which yeah. normally. Yes. That makes sense, which okay. sucks, but. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that got here, deep for you guys. I'm, we're sorry. That was, that was a little, that was pretty geeky. Yeah. Now let me tell you a heartwarming story. And it's also a scary story. Um, and I've got to be really careful with the details because this is a, a current uh, client and a case in our office. But I met with this client um, twice in the last two weeks. Um, she is now 21 years old, ironically, based on some of the other little comments I made throughout the show. She actually is 21 years old. She has three younger siblings and her mom and dad both died within a month of, or two of each other uh, about two years ago. And um, family and community came to rally for her and her family. And I was recommended to help out and I helped out and I've been doing it pro bono and helping this, this oldest daughter who's 21 now. And I don't wanna get emotional, but I've just been so impressed. Um, there was assets, there was no will, no trust. There was retirement accounts. There was social security, all sorts of stuff. And to this girl's credit, she freaking put it all in the bank, went to college. And I swear she spent 5% of it just on really basic conservative items. 
And I've really been a cheerleader for her, telling her that she is years beyond her age and wisdom. Um, and I'm so proud of her. So if she's listening to the show and she's starting to get a self-directed account going with some of the retirement accounts and all these sorts of things. And, um, and her parents died before the Secure Act. So she has a really long retirement. Okay. Yeah. But I just want to tell everybody that that is probably the exception and not the rule. Um, and I, I have to even probably admit if I was a kid at age 21 and someone gave me a hundred grand in an IRA and I could pay what penalty? I don't care. Give me the money. And <laughs> certainly, you know, and so, it, but it's anyway, true. the point is, I think too many parents have faith in their kids. I meet with so many parents that are like, yeah, I'm just going to make my oldest kid the trustee and I'm going to, yeah, they can have all the money when they're 21. I'm like, what are you smoking? Don't you remember being 21? I mean, now maybe you were, you know, goody two shoe nerd of the class. And I wish I could look back at myself and say, yeah, I was pretty smart at age 21, but who knows what they could be facing a bad boyfriend, a bad girlfriend, financial issues, credit card debt. And you're going to put a lump sum of money in front of them and they can, and there's no restriction that they can tap into it. Be careful people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, retirement accounts have been one of the greatest assets for Americans um, that it's, it's getting passed on to the next generation. So it's really particular that you plan for this asset. It happens on the beneficiary designation form again, and can be in connection with your trust as, as we mentioned here on the see through trust provisions. So hopefully you understand the options here, whether it's planning for yourself or you're in the situation now trying to decide what to do with an account that you've inherited from a loved one, whether it's spouse or um, a non-spouse. So I do want to say too, we do have a page on directedira.com. If you just go to the inherited IRA account page at directedira.com, there's some articles that summarize these rules. So you can just see it in writing. Sometimes it's easier to just digest it in writing too after hearing it um, as you're making the selections on what you're going to do with your inherited retirement account. Yeah. And uh, it's easy to change. If some of you are like, oh my gosh, I don't even know who my beneficiary is, or it's my ex-spouse from 10 years ago, or I have no idea deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm going to finish with one last strategy too, um, which I think is a little cherry on top kicker, but talk about this issue in your annual planning strategy session with your tax lawyer, your accountant, your lawyer, whoever it is. Hopefully it's maybe someone on our team that takes a holistic view with tax and legal and asset protection all together, but bring this up. Say, Hey, what is our plan with an inherited IRAs? If your advisor can't talk intelligently on this topic, maybe you're not going to fire them because they're good in other areas, but you got to be talking about this with someone that knows what yeah. they're doing because it's just something you don't want to jack up. Um, that's a technical term, by the way. And here's my last strategy. Okay. My mom, gosh, another emotional moment. My mom is awesome. I love her. My dad died 10 years ago, approximately, but, um, my mom is not doing well dementia and she's going blind. Um, she can't even read books or watch, you know, golden girls which I would watch with her. I love Betty White. Um, but um, she's not doing well. But um, I've talked to her. I'm like, I'm going to set you up a Roth IRA and I'll give you the money and that's funded. And I'm going to be your beneficiary. And she's like, okay, I don't care. My brother and sister are like, whatever. If you give her the money to do it, you can have it. And so I, and I don't think that's being morbid or I'm just trying to plan as a family. So I'm saying now I can triple down, see? So I've got mine, my spouse's, and my mom's Roth IRA that I'm funding. And I'm the beneficiary of those other two. And well, all three. And my wife can do this with her parents. And so if you have a parent out there, young or old, doing good and health or bad, you may say, hey, uh, talk to your siblings and go, I'm going to open up a Roth IRA over at directed IRA and start self-directing it, but I'm going to put the money in and I get it in writing, get it in writing from all your siblings that they say, okay, that's your Roth IRA. We disclaim it. It's not a part of mom's estate because you don't want to build that sucker up. And then the kid, the brothers and sisters go, well, you got mom's Roth IRA. No, like, I freaking put the money in there. That's money. You know, I just use that as a strategy. So mm -hmm. they'll turn on, trust me at the dining room table. So make sure you get a, a, in writing from everybody that says, 
we agree that's not part of mom's estate. You're going to be the one to fund it and you're the beneficiary. And, yeah. um, and, but that's powerful. It's honest. It's legit. Yeah. It's legal. Yeah. And that seems to be even a more popular strategy with back when you could do the life expectancy method, because, you know, before Mark would be able to inherit that and take it out over his entire lifetime. Now Ooh. he's going to get a 10 year window, which is still good. You'll get a 10 year window to keep investing that funds, keep it tax free. It's going to come out tax free. If five years into that, he's like, ah, I want to take it all out. No tax. Pretty sweet. So yeah. that's the strategy. Well, okay. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in to the directed IRA podcast. Uh, we will be back of course next week with. Say yes. the authoritative word. Okay. The most authoritative podcast yes. on, <laughs> on any topic out there in the world. <laughs> um, Love it. Yeah. So, but, uh, but thanks for being, hope you learned something again, go to directedira.com slash podcast to learn more about the podcast and see prior episodes. If you don't know what the heck self-directing is, we've mentioned it a few times here and you just found this on inherited IRAs, go back to episode one. You can learn what self-directing is all about and how you can buy alternative assets like real estate, crypto, private companies, funds, hedge funds, all in an IRA. Um, it's called a self-directed IRA. It's what we do here at our company, Directed IRA. Thanks for oh. listening. And well, oh. next week, should we do open forum next week? Ooh, we call it let's do now? open forum. Good. Okay. Yes. So go to directedra.com slash podcast, where you can enter in your questions. We will be filling those questions during the open forum podcast next week. Love it. 